Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news. Please don't forget the donate button at the top of the webpage, the subscribe button, the share button, the sign up on our email list, all the buttons. And we'll be back in a second to talk about Canada's response to Israel's war on Palestine. Israel's war on Palestine continues with at least 200 deaths in Gaza, including 58 children. In Israel, there have been about a dozen deaths reported, including two children. The Canadian government released a statement by its foreign minister, Mark Gonneau, which said, quote, The indiscriminate barrage of rocket attacks fired by Hamas into populated areas of Israel is absolutely unacceptable and must cease immediately. Canada supports Israel's right to live in peace with its neighbors within secure boundaries and recognizes Israel's right to assure its own security, which is another way of saying condemning what Hamas's rockets are doing in Israel, but supporting Israel's rockets and bombs falling on Gaza. Back to the statement. Canada is deeply disturbed by the completely unacceptable violence in Jerusalem, including in and around Al-Aqsa. These events are especially upsetting during the holy month of Ramadan. Places of worship are for people to gather for peaceful reflection and should never be sites of violence. It is crucial to respect the sanctity and safety of holy sites. Violence in and around Haram al-Sharif and Temple Mount must stop. Well, there's an actual hint of a critique of Israel, but of course they don't mention the word Israel there. Back to the statement, quote, Canada remains gravely concerned by the continued expansion of settlements and by the demolitions and evictions, including ongoing cases around Sharik Jaha and Sewan. These actions impact families and livelihoods and do not serve peace or international law. Unilateral actions that prejudge the outcome of direct negotiations further jeopardize the prospects for a two-state solution must be avoided. Well, again, a hint of a critique of Israel here. What's missing, though, is a condemnation of the brutal Israeli attacks on Gaza or laying blame on Israel for the, quote, unacceptable violence in Jerusalem, which was, in fact, a campaign of ethnic cleansing carried out by the Israeli government that triggered the current escalation of the conflict. Canada tries to appear as having an even hand towards the conflict, but its support for Israel goes way beyond such statements. Now joining us to talk about Canada's relationship to Israel and Palestine is Karen Rodman. She's a human rights advocate and founder of Just Peace Advocates and Palestine Just Trade. Karen served as a human rights volunteer and observer in Palestine for the World Council of Churches. She's a retired uh, senior management uh, in leadership with the Ontario Public Service. Also joining us is Eves Engler. He's a Montreal-based activist and author. He has published 11 books, including his latest, House of Mirrors, Justin Trudeau's Foreign Policy. Thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, so Karen, uh, when I say we're looking at the relationship of Canada to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, we're not just talking about the government. So why don't we start with what's happening across the country in response to the recent events? Yeah, so very much civil society is coming onto the streets and taking uh, action in other ways through uh, letter writing and Twitter and uh, social media. Um, over the weekend, I think uh, um, Eve could speak better, but there was probably close to 10,000 people on the streets in Montreal. There was here in Toronto as well, uh, large crowds in Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, thousands of people, Halifax. But even more amazing than that, uh, many cities across the country um, that haven't uh, had, uh, you know, actions, at least not since 2014, and maybe not even then since the last war on Gaza, places, uh, you know, Windsor, Guelph, Oakville, Milton, um, places that have small, strong Palestinian um, activist communities or advocacy communities like Victoria and St. John's, Newfoundland, had large number of people out. But I mean, the other thing, it's just quite amazing. Our own small organization, Just Peace Advocates, does quite a bit of letter writing uh, to the Canadian government uh, through uh, an action network uh, letter writing, as does the uh, organization that Eve's part of Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. And uh, we put a letter out just about two weeks ago or so around Sheikh Jarrah, and we had um, 10,000 letters written just like within a few days 
uh, by Canadians to the uh, Canadian government uh, in regard to Sheikh Jarrah and also asking the government to make a strong statement urgently in regard to a petition that was uh, presented by a Liberal Member of Parliament, um, Nathaniel Erskine-Smith from here in uh, Beaches East York uh, in Toronto. Um, so far as you've just said in uh, mentioning the most recent statement, I think three statements have been made by the Canadian government. and. Um, and none of them have uh, began to uh, touch the points that we had raised in that petition um, around the siege of Gaza, around international law and Canada's responsibility under Article 1 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, around Sheikh Jarrah specifically and the family's impact there. So the government's hearing loud and clear a call for sanctions, a call for emergency debate in the parliament, a call for speaking out loudly uh, um, and clearly and using whatever means are necessary diplomatically or through uh, sanctions or other mechanisms. Eve, uh, th these calls uh, are, are quite concrete in terms of Canadian law. Uh, you and I were talking off camera uh, a couple of days ago. You know, there's been generally responses that are kind of general support for the Palestinians and such. But this is more specific that, that there's a, some of the, what's going on here is in direct violation of Canadian law in support of Israel. Uh, what, what, what is that story? Justice Advocates and Canadian Foreign Policy Institute put out a, a letter writing campaign around uh, upholding Canadian law regarding uh, uh, enlistment for the Israeli military, which contravenes Canada's Foreign Enlistment Act. Uh, there's a couple hundred uh, Canadians fighting in the IDF. Um, which and, and they've been recruited in ways that almost certainly contravene Canadian law. Uh, also, there's uh, as part of this call uh, was for calling on the Canada Revenue Agency to uphold its guidelines regarding uh, support for foreign militaries. And the Canada Revenue Agency guidelines are real quite clear that um, you can't support another country's military and be subsidized by the Canadian taxpayer uh, through charitable status. Uh, so we, we put out a call on those issues, uh, and really the intent there is to uh, highlight uh, Canada's complicity in Palestinian dispossession. And that's an issue that, that really doesn't get enough attention. This isn't just, you know, if the Canadian government tomorrow came out with a, a clear statement that said uh, Israel's committing war crimes in Gaza, that it's uh, committing ethnic cleansing in, in East Jerusalem, uh, Canada would still be massively complicit uh, in uh, those those war crimes and in that ethnic cleansing, because Canada has just a innumerable different ways in which it's been supporting uh, Israeli apartheid in in recent years and and you know going back uh, decades from before the creation of Israel. Uh, talk a little bit about this law against uh, Canadians volunteering to fight in f other countries' armies. Uh, I know it goes back at least to the time of the Spanish Civil War, where they actually tried to go after some Canadians that were fighting on the anti-fascist side. Uh, to what extent has this law been implemented? Yeah, so there was a Foreign Enlistment Act that Canada had that goes back to 1870, which was actually a British law. Uh, and, uh, and then there was actually an even earlier British version, and that was uh, British law, was Canadian law for a long time. Um, and, uh, but then in, in 1937, when there were Canadians that were, uh, um, going to fight against, uh, Franco's fascist forces in Spain, uh, the government, the Mackenzie King government at the time, uh, which was, uh, I would say, you know, softly aligned with, uh, with Franco's fascists, uh, actually brought in an updated, uh, Canadian version of the Foreign Enlistment Act that, that said it was illegal to recruit uh, or induce others to uh, join another country's uh, uh, military with the intent of stopping the, uh, the Canadians, a few thousand Canadians that went uh, to Spain uh, at the time. So that, that law has been on the books uh, since 1937. Let me just add that my uncle was a volunteer. He went to Spain and part of the Mac Paps. And uh, they had to sm essentially smuggle him to get over there. They, they, there was a real concern of the Canadian authorities arresting uh, individuals are going to support the anti-fascists in Spain. And there's a whole, like, uh, I can't remember what the whole thing was. He told me once, but it was quite a complicated endeavor to get out of the country without getting arrested. Yeah. And I believe there were individuals that were pursued criminally uh, for violating the Foreign Enlistment Act. I don't believe they were 
ever convicted. I think the government eventually uh, sort of dropped uh, the cases. I'm not uh, sure of all the details, uh, but but the the, the the Enlistment Act has been on the books since that time, but since at least 1947, there have been Canadians uh, fighting uh, for the IDF or its predecessor, uh, Zionist forces. So in 1947-48, during the, during the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, uh, there were at least 300 Canadians that were uh, recruited, uh, World War II Canadian veterans, uh, in some cases very uh, highly skilled uh, um, uh, military people, like the, the the most famous Canadian uh, fighter pilot at the time, um, they were recruited uh, uh, to join the Israeli military. The the person who recruited the lead recruiter in, in Toronto, Ben Dunkelman, who was the heir to the Tip Top Tailors. Um, uh, he claimed actually a thousand Canadians that he was involved in recruiting a thousand Canadians to fight for the the Israeli military. Was there any attempt by the Canadian government to stop it? Uh, no, no. They actually did all kinds of things to facilitate. Uh, at one point, um, the uh, Canadian uh, a fighter pilot, Buzz, uh, Buzz Burling, I believe was his name, the most famous World War II ace, he actually got stopped, I believe, in Lebanon en route. Uh, and Canadian officials got him, got him out, um, if I'm remembering the story uh, correctly, got him out of detention. Um, but yeah, so there was a... There was a there was a passive support uh, for that recruitment at the time, but that's basically continued to, you know, to varying degrees for the past 70 plus years. Um, so to the point where in, in January of 2020, the Canadian ambassador in Israel actually organized a pizza party for the Canadians fighting in the IDF, had a formal uh, uh, dinner party uh, for Canadians fighting in the IDF, um, uh, which is kind of an unbelievable thing for the top diplomat of Canada to be supporting any country's military. Uh, you know, if it's a top diplomat in, in Kampala, Uganda, the idea of you know, supporting Canadians that were in the Ugandan military or the French military or any, any military is, is kind of hard to, hard to imagine, but particularly egregious when we know what the Israeli military is involved in. It's involved in this long-standing occupation that even the Canadian government views as contrary to international law when they repeatedly, as they put it, mow the lawn in Gaza and, you know, destroy buildings, kill people, shoot at, at uh, uh, you know, sniper fire for protesters in Gaza, on and on and on. Um, and this is just one way in which Canada is, is deeply complicit in, um, in, uh, in Israel's, you know, apartheid uh, uh, regime. Probably the most important way Canada is complicit uh, and an issue that gets basically no attention is the fact that there, in 2018, there was more than a quarter billion dollars uh, raised uh, by registered Canadian charities uh, for uh, uh, Israel-focused projects. Uh, and so that's being subsidized by the Canadian taxpayer by about a third to maybe 40, between 30 and 40 percent of those donations are, are, are being paid for by the Canadian taxpayer. So something in the range of 100 million dollars. Um, and these are these are going to mostly, you know, going to, you know, supporting uh, is, the Israeli symphony or Israeli university or hospital. Uh, but also a lot of it is, is channeled to projects that that support uh, the IDF in one way or another. Uh, it's that support, uh, uh, you know, explicitly racist organizations like the Jewish National Fund uh, that support uh, West Bank uh, settlements. And all of that ostensibly is contrary to Canadian Canada Revenue, Revenue Agency guidelines. Uh, you not Charities are not allowed to support uh, another country's military. They're not allowed to support uh, uh, racist organizations, explicitly racist organizations. They're not allowed to support uh, West Bank settlements, which go contrary to Canadian uh, uh, policy. Um, and so certainly millions, probably tens of millions of dollars uh, are being channeled to projects that ostensibly contravene Canada Revenue Agency uh, 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 guidelines. And there's almost no uh, campaigning on this. Um, but this is just, you know, one of many different ways in which Canada has, has been going back, uh, you know, decades and continues to be um, uh, supporting uh, Israel uh, as it continues to dispossess uh, uh, Palestinians. Uh, Karen, the, the, there, your organization, I think, Eves, there is a, a campaign petition on the question of Canadians joining the IDF. And is there, I think, is there one on this issue of the contributions, financial contributions? And, and where, where are those campaigns at? 
Yeah, so there's two active campaigns right now. One is a letter writing campaign, which I think is around 1,800 or, or more letters in the last few days to the Minister of, of Finance, the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and uh, and to Justice Minister Lametti. So it brings together, just as Eve has spoken, the charity aspect as well as the uh, illegal military recruiting for the Israeli uh, military. There also is the parliamentary petition that I think you're responding to um, or mentioning as well, which uh, NDP member um, from Hamilton Centre, Matthew Green, has sponsored. And um, it's at about, I think, five times the number of uh, signatures required for it to move forward. It uh, basically is the campaign around military recruiting. It calls for uh, investigation into and, re and requires Lametti or calls for Lametti the Minister of Justice to uh, do an investigation into uh, military recruiting and inducing of, uh, military recruiting using uh, the, the language of the Foreign um, uh, Enlistment Act and laying charges were warranted. So essentially that petition follows the legal complaint that um, Eves and my organization and, and two other organizations uh, put in as an official legal complaint to Minister Lametti on October 19th. At that time, there were 170 uh, signatures, uh, some well-known Canadians and others like uh, Roger Waters and Ken Loth and Loke and others who had signed it. Um, and then that has followed through with um, many, many letters that were written originally, around 1,500 to uh, Lametti. And then the RCMP uh, was to move forward and, and does have an open investigation open um, at the present time. And that was because Lametti basically um, deferred the issue to the RCMP. So there's been letter writing uh, um, in that regard and evidence has been provided by um, our organization. And is there an indication that they actually are doing an investigation? Um, they've indicated that it's active on two occasions to us, but there's been no follow up to uh, to look or do further information that we're aware of. So we feel it's important to have that public, uh, public voice, public pressure, I suppose, through now the parliamentary petition, as well as the ongoing letter writing uh, that's uh, been happening. And what about the mainstream media? Has any has there been any real coverage of this issue? It, it, it should be a news story. It, it should be, and it was actually initially. Uh, the Quebec media has been more, uh, the Francophone media has been more favorable to us than uh, the English media. Uh, originally, the day that we delivered the uh, registered letter to Lametti in October, Le Devoir ran a, an article, um, and the reporter uh, followed up, Marie Vestel, I believe it is, uh, followed up the next day with a question to Lametti during another press conference. He then mentioned that it was going to the RCMP. So that was actually October 20th. And that was on, I believe, the front page of Le Devoir. Um, there has been pretty wide coverage, but a lot of it has been in alternative coverage or coverage in uh, from other countries rather than our own mainstream English media. Um, there was some coverage in the Jewish Independent and, um, and also uh, other uh, article uh, um, showing that this is an item that really should have got coverage but hasn't because the mainstream media has covered the loan soldiers through uh, articles in the CBC and other media over the years and even those journalists weren't prepared to pick up on the story in, in, in this light, right? Eva, when, when countries, when there's lists of Western countries that are pro, quote unquote, pro-Israeli, uh, Canada's usually right up there, maybe after the United States. Uh, I don't think that reflects Canadian public opinion, but it certainly reflects decades of Canadian government policy. Uh, why, why do you think the Canadian government goes so overboard in being so so pro-Israel? Well, there's a few factors. First of all, I think that people should understand just how pro-Israel the Canadian government is. I mean, just a couple of days ago, the Trudeau government, which claims to be you know anti-racist, pulled out of a uh, UN uh, racism conference to to placate uh, Israel and its supporters. Uh, if you go back, you know, historically, the partition plan that was, you know, the first 1947 UN plan that, that basically began a very formalized Palestinian dispossession, Canada was a central player at the UN on the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine that went to the region that shaped the plan. 
Uh, they were Canadians that helped conquer Palestine for the British Empire in 1917. Um, hundreds of Canadians, it was a Canadian general that led a, a failed mission to conquer uh, Gaza. And then later, uh, individuals who were su successful. Uh, uh, you know, today you got a Canada-Israel free trade agreement uh, that includes the occupied West Bank as where Israel's custom laws apply. You have the Canadian government voting against uh, something like 70, this is the Trudeau government, voting against something like 70 UN resolutions that have been supported by basically every other country in the world. Um, so there's a, and then it just goes on and on and on in different different ways. Um, and and I think that there, there's a number of factors going on. I mean, historically, Canada was part of the British Empire and uh, Zionism was an outgrowth of, of British imperialism. And, and so Zionism found a lot of favor among uh, the elite in Canada, uh, certainly after the Balfour Declaration of 1917, you know, before and then even more so after the Balfour Declaration. Uh, subsequently, Canada has uh, has become, you know, with World War II, has become kind of like you know, tied very tightly tied to the British Empire, to being very tightly tied to the American Empire, and the American Empire has been uh, uh, a very pro uh, pro Israel and Zionist, certainly at least since 1967, but you know, even even before that. Um, there's a long history, actually, in Canada. Zionism doesn't begin as a as a Jewish movement, but in fact, begins as a Christian movement, as Christian Zionist activism for decades in Canada before there is uh, a Jewish Zionist uh, activism. Um, uh, so there's, there's many different factors. In, in, in recent decades, I would say that it, it's um, the you know, pro-Israel lobby, predominantly uh, uh, Jewish organizations, uh, but not exclusively, uh, is very uh, influential. Uh, I would say uh, especially since 9-11, uh, and uh, and there's uh, you know very uh, effective uh, uh, lobbying campaigns that are are uh, you know basically put the pro-Palestinian movement uh, on the back foot kind of at every every step of the way. So Canada's a mix of you know a history of Christian Zionism, Canada's ties to empire, uh, and uh, uh, um, a substantive uh, uh, anti-Palestinian lobby. Um, that uh, is able to, uh, you know, scare politicians. Uh, if you look at what's happened with uh, Jagmeet Singh and the NDP, uh, you know, he's shown just very clearly how, uh, how fearful he is of being, uh, you know, labeled uh, anti-Semitic uh, for taking up the Palestinian cause. Um, and so, so those sort of campaigns are, are quite effective in undermining um, uh, official political expressions of, of what you point out. And, 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 Polls show this. The, the Canadian population is 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 way more sympathetic to the Palestinian cause than is expressed in Canadian uh, uh, political life. So the outpouring of protests in in, uh, in over the weekend are, are really important. But it's also important to you know channel channel that political energy towards a movement that really starts targeting the different ways in which Canada is currently and has been complicit in, uh, in Palestinian dispossession. All right. Well, thank you both very much for joining me. Thank, thank you, Paul. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. Please don't forget the donate button and all the other buttons. <laughs>